how was your trip? Let me, uh, let me go ahead and record. There we are. Yep. Um, it was fantastic, man. I, 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 uh, have you been to Portland? Uh, yes. Many times. We, oh, we, we yeah. absolutely love it up there. It's great. Yeah. I, I, um, you know, we went to the, uh, the Japanese gardens mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. Where else? Uh, man, it was a city park. Uh, we stayed in a neighborhood called, um, I think it's called uh, Fremont. Is, is no, it's not. Is it Fremont? Fremont. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Fremont. Fremont. Yeah. yeah. We stayed at, we stayed in Fremont. Food there is fantastic. I mean, we loved it. I mean, the food game over there is like, it really caught me off guard because it's just, it's crazy. It's, you know, I didn't, I didn't expect no joke. it. I didn't expect it to be this good, man. But um, there's, there's more restaurants in Portland than there are than there are people. You know, I, I heard um, I heard it's like uh, they're proud of their entrepreneurial spirit up there. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. We we love it. We, we usually stay at, at the uh, Pineapple Inn. Um, and so okay. we, we, we get the train uh, right from the airport and, and it literally goes right there. And uh, it's it's not it's like five minutes from Chinatown. And we, we oh, actually okay. would walk from there to the Japanese garden. And it's maybe a two hour walk. Mm -hmm. and, but it's such a nice uh, jaunt up there and then through the gardens. Yeah. And um, I don't know if I told you, but we're thinking about uh, possibly uh, moving to another state. We're looking at Oregon. No, you didn't. And, and yeah, Portland. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're looking at Oregon. I mean, we went to, uh, we went all over, you know, we're there for a few days and, um, we also went to Cannon beach as well. Um, so that was, that was really nice too, nice, as well. Nice. Um, Eugene, Eugene is a great, uh, a great city. If you haven't mm -hmm. been there. Yeah, I gotta, I definitely gotta go. We're thinking about going again, possibly maybe for my birthday, like, nice. uh, towards like me. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> uh, why not? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, I loved it and the weather there, obviously, uh, it rained, uh, during our last leg of the trip, but overall it was, it was, it was nice. It was very pretty. Uh, we got to do a lot of outdoor activities. Um, we went to this place called silver falls also, which was, I, I was just going to mention this. Silver yeah, falls. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was beautiful. Yeah. It's a nice hike there. And there's actually a vineyard that's about five minutes down the road from there as well. That uh, there's nice, there's nice wine tasting there. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. So we're, you know, we're thinking about uh, California is getting a little bit too hectic if you want to invest in real estate. So we were thinking about uh, possibly going to another state now. So um, yeah, a, a lot of my friends are leaving California and actually going to Montana oh, and okay. they are, so in Montana, I haven't been there, but according to what they tell me that it's very similar to Oregon, but mm. like a fraction of the price. Mm. And so one of my buddies, uh, he's in the medical field and he lives around me here and mm. his parents moved there two years ago and they went back and forth and visit and mm. um, they're in the process of selling their house now and going to be moving there within the next couple of months. And you know, for what they sold their, their house for here, will sell it for it. They can get a massive house and huge land. Uh, out there in Montana. And so he just said that, you know, it's just a much better quality of life. They've got two kids and oh, yeah. like being in California with that, the crappy schools, you know, crime rate going through the roof. It's just not safe. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're thinking. I, I don't know if I told you, but my, my wife is pregnant. So no, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to have our first uh, kid, uh, our first child. You will uh, have your hands full due in november <laughs> oh nice nice yeah, so my, my birthday's in november and same with uh, my son he, he's also oh, nice. he's beginning on end but yeah it's uh being a parent is is the hardest job i've ever had <laughs> well i don't know anything about it but i will find out <laughs> Come feel, free, feel free to ask any questions yeah my, my youngest uh, he's uh he's four months old and uh, my, my daughter is two and a half so uh, you had a boy right yeah. Yeah. So I have a boy and a girl. So they keep uh, us on our toes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's get into our because we got a lot to talk about today. So. Um, so anyways, this is our this is our second or third podcast. Hopefully, uh, um, hopefully we're going to start. Uh, this is uh, one of many that that I got planned. Uh, but, we're, you know, we're having a, a podcast today for a blog section and we wanted to introduce Aaron Duss, which he has over 20 years of experience in the UX uh, industry, in the UX field. 
and he has a lot of knowledge to share with us. And uh, for anyone looking to start a website, I think this is going to be a very good podcast to start with because um, obviously user experience is everything. Yep. It's literally the beginning stage of almost any, any app, any website out there that you truly want to function correctly. And, um, you know, I just, uh, you know, I felt that Aaron has a lot of knowledge to share with everyone. So uh, listen up closely because he's going to share a lot of knowledge with you guys. So <laughs> why don't you, uh, yeah, so Aaron, why don't you tell us like how you got started with UX? Because, you know, that's something that a lot of people don't usually start with. Um, and a lot of people are still, you know, they probably know about UX, but they probably never okay. actually heard that term or, or, you know, like, oh, I just want to plan out my website, but tell us a little bit of how you started with, with UX. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, just as a little bit of background and context, uh, you know, we've worked together now for a couple of years now, you helped to design uh, the Baldi's website and we've done a couple other projects together. And right off the bat, you know, it, it was clear that there was a synergy between how we understand people and how to communicate the infrastructure of what people's needs are uh, on a website. And so that kind of lays the foundation for me of what uh, UX and, and CX customer experience is. And, you know, by, by training, I am not a UX designer, but more uh, as a strategist uh, who looks at marketing and innovation through a lens of, of people, right? And so by understanding what the user needs uh, holistically, over time has translated into how do you create experiences and pathways that meet their needs, but also create surprise and delight moments that actually will allow someone to stay on your site longer, use your app more consistently, and ultimately uh, transact in some way, whether that's buying a product, earning a coin for credit to use later, or to be able to fulfill on something else that your brand is looking to create. And so every time I, I look to either create an experience and whatnot, you know, I, I go back to the foundation of UX design. And that was by a guy named uh, uh, Donald Norman. And he used to work at Apple and he created this fantastic book uh, for the design of everyday things. And in, in the book, he talks about, you know, we need to really just pay attention to the complexities of design that are often overlooked and simplify that to make the experience just so much easier for people. Because mm -hmm. it's very easy to create a complexity it's very difficult to reduce complexity and take something to the most essence form. And that's something that we spend our careers really just whittling away, you know, the, the, the non-important details mm -hmm. to look at what is the clear message? What is the takeaway? What is the call to action? And just be ruthless on that. And so the field of CX and uh, UX in a, as, a, as a form of thought leadership really just exemplifies that for, for people looking to create a website. And like you said, there's tools today and they've come a long way to be able to help anyone to be able to lay out a flow, a wireframe of something. But when you apply behavioral psychology to it and, and behavioral economics, those things change a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where CX actually really shines is being able to dovetail those together to create a consistent brand experience. So uh, often, you know, I'll, I'll work on creating some frames based on a set of insights. I'll work with other UX, CX designers and other creatives and together collaboratively come up with a site design and experience that is going to be representative of the brand or the project I'm looking to work on. Mm. No, I mean, that's, uh... I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's brilliant. I mean, everything starts with, with UX obviously. And, um, and yeah, Fred did forget to mention, we have worked on a few projects and, um, I can say that Aaron, uh, as you know, as part of UX makes everything so much easier for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, usually, you know, uh, when we start a website, for example, we don't get as much information as, uh, easy and as, uh, tailored as you, uh, as you obviously put it, you know, and, um, sometimes we, you know, I've actually, uh, I kind of started, you know, diving into UX a little bit a, a long time ago, probably like back in, uh, 2010, mm -hmm. um, you know, creating wireframes and whatnot. Um, you know, and, and sometimes clients didn't understand, well, why are you creating this? Like, why can't you just slap something together, you know? And, sure. and uh, but then after I created the wireframe, it just made the whole process and the whole project a lot more smoothly. And, um, and everything progressed very nicely where the client finally understood, okay, this is the reason why we're creating wireframes. This is the reason why we're actually planning out, like the mapping out the content of how it's going to go 
and all that. But um, but yeah, I mean, UX is definitely um, something that's that's evolved, you know, throughout the years, and especially like you said with Apple. Mm-hmm. Um, now I know I know that Apple. Uh, when did they actually start with this whole clean design? Do you do you uh, did it start with this? Um, I think it goes all the way back to to Steve Jobs and really right at the core of wanting simplicity at the core. So uh, I, I would say that it goes back that far and it's continued to evolve. Um, you know, Donald Norman was there uh, in, the, in the late 80s and 90s mm-hmm. and on. So, you know, he was there, you know, when all of this stuff was like the cutting edge that no one would know what UX is, you know, uh, and even back then it was still largely just design, Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, because the, again, uh, as context for people like this is still dial up days, very early web, yeah. you know, pre 1.0. <laughs> so yeah. this is, this is like going OG, uh, but, but I think what it does is it really just looks at, you know, how do you draw on that complexity and simplify it in a way that's going to help to um, reduce roadblocks for people. Mm. And, you know, when you think of it, you know, we're doing this as a podcast auditorily, but the majority of people today are visual learners. They're, they respond visually. And hence to your point about you know, how people will respond when they see, you know, a, a wireframe, it, it's because the visual recognition makes sense to them. You know, they're able to justify it. They see it, they imprint into their mind something that's familiar to them. They've all, you know, people have been on websites, they know, but when you speak about it abstractly, it's so difficult to, to get a client to understand that. So, you know, this is where, you know, again, you and I have worked in the text version of something, it makes sense, but sometimes to a client, it's not always you know, as clear and concrete. They have to imagine where these cells and fields would go. But as soon as you put it into a wireframe, that it automatically, the, the light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, I, I see exactly what you're talking about. I see where it goes. I see how it flows in the progression. And you're able to move then much faster because you've created a reference point to start from. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, I know you've been in this industry for about 20 years. I know you also have um, you also have uh, experience uh, working all across the world, you know, um, mm-hmm. with companies in Canada and in uh, in Europe as well. I, I um, and I also know that you uh, you're a big fan of uh, of uh, what what is it called the the coral uh, coral reefs or the- <laughs> <laughs> reef keeping exactly reef keeping yeah reef keeping yeah that's a, that's interesting and I know that you also work with um, with a lot of these companies that are that are in that industry. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your work experience, like what you've, you know, where you've been at? Um, you, I, I know you've also been a CMO at mm-hmm. a company. Um, so um, you, that means that you have a lot of experience as well with marketing. And, um, and yeah, tell us a little bit about that as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so I spent the, nearly the last 20 years, you know, kind of at that intersection of storytelling and story selling mm-hmm. and, you know, applying it towards marketing, towards strategy. Uh, innovation and product design around the world. So, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to really start my career in Asia. I, I started in Singapore working for a consultancy company there that really helped to take companies outside of Asia who were looking to get into the Asian market to understand that. So from an anthropological perspective and to create brands, experiences and products that'd be tailored to both uh, folks living in Asia, but also expats living in Asia who are wanting, you know, um, brands from around the world. And so I spent some time there really just learning the, the craft of stepping into other people's shoes. And, and again, as a skill set, that was something that I could apply and have throughout my career. Um, oh, and then over time, you know, I, I lived across Asia and then hop skipped over to Europe for a little while, lived in Scandinavia for a bit, and then in Canada, uh, teaching at a design school there called OCAD, and then moved to New York, uh, where I taught at uh, Pratt Institute and then worked uh, for some rather large agencies uh, in, in New York, uh, RGA being uh, one of the largest, uh, where I really just I was able to take my craft as a strategist and planner, work with CX and UX designers and creatives to learn the skills, learn how they all um, correlate with one another and be able to advance that. You know, and several years later, be able to take that and continually you know, grow through different ranks at different organizations to now be a CMO. So chief marketing officer, chief strategy officer uh, at an LA startup. So, you know, really being able to take these things and bring it to life in a way that 
uh, kind of like building blocks, right? And take things throughout your career to use it in different ways. So uh, I attribute a lot of what I do today is being able to, like a DJ would take, you know, the two different tracks and splice them together. And so, you know, I take a lot of my experiences, uh, you know, over the last 20 years and splice them into things to create new things mm -hmm. and stuff that would otherwise be overlooked. So again, one of the core principles of UX. What do you enjoy more, uh, working on marketing or, uh, or, or designing experiences? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I don't think that they're separate. I think that they're, they're one and the same because if I'm creating a campaign to launch a new product, it's often tied to an experience because everything we do today is an experience. True. So, you know, you, you may define it slightly differently, right? Uh, an online experience, an event, a digital experience, a site experience, mm. but all of that is marketing in different ways because you're telling a story, you're conveying a message. So mm. I, I think these days, the lines between stuff has become so blurred that it's just about resources and tools that you have that you can apply it to get to an end game or an end state. Yeah, um, and what you said about the lines being blurred, that's absolutely true. I mean, uh, now there's, uh, you know, all these empty malls, uh, there, there's ideas swimming around and, you know, online where <laughs> these businesses, these online only businesses, e-commerce stores are opening up shops just to mm -hmm. create a experiential, you know, some sort of uh, experience where they can experience the product, hold it, you know, and mm -hmm. then purchase it online. Obviously they don't have stocks there, but they make it easy so people can just order online, you know, so you're, yeah. you know, you're diving into that hole um, and you're, you know, you're absolutely right. That's the, everything's become blurred. Uh, you're um, you know, you're giving off data, you know, everywhere, everywhere you mm -hmm. go. And, and, you know, nowadays AI allows you to, to collect all this data and really process it and come up with, you know, specific, uh, uh, what is it, a uh, user uh, user experiences, right? That's right, and pass the purchase. And, and this is where I think the frontier is. It's like, you know, where up until now, and maybe even within the last few years, you know, you gave your data away for free and brand, brands collected it and, and mined it for their own purposes and profit. Yeah. I think there's a, a new wave of currency coming in, which is your own user data. And how do you monetize it and sell it to companies mm -hmm. based on the actions that you're doing? You know, it's because it's, it's kind of like, Influencer 2.0, they would give you stuff to be able to talk about it and you'd be able to keep it and make a, you know, a, a small amount of money off it. Hmm. I think that there's going to be a paradigm shift where people's data is going to become more and more private uh, by choice and by necessity. Mm -hmm. And I think that we will come the day where you will be able to sell pieces and parts of your data to brands uh, and they will be able to work with it and use it. But I think that the, the shift of power is we're at the prefaces right, right now. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, everything is just, everything is progressing so fast. <laughs> uh, and um, I know there's a, a big battle going on with, uh, you know, especially with data. And um, I know the, uh, I, I think the, 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 the FCC, right, is, is, uh, is trying to, trying to uh, regulate that as well. Mm -hmm. and, and Apple with the new, um, with the new iOS, you know, they're blocking a lot of data from Facebook. Yep. So um, there's, you know, there's a lot of battle, there's, there's a lot of battles going on for your data. I mean, who would have thought that that's, that's one of the most valuable things in the world now? <laughs> you know? Data has become, you know, the golden key, you know, yeah. who controls the data, you know, controls everything. And, and so, you know, yeah. this, is, this is interesting when you look at going back to, to transaction and purchasing, mm. uh, th there's certain things that we've become so comfortable with transacting online with not needing to tactic, tactilely experience it. There's other things that we still like to go to a store and physically touch something and hold it and to mm -hmm. see and try it on. Yeah. And, and it'll be interesting as time goes on, what those experiences are, you know, the, the whole notion of, you know, getting something in a box and then sampling it and keeping and sending stuff back is again, I think changing the way that you experience things. Uh, and again, all of the different birch boxes and boxes of every brand that, that exists today. Um, take what I think is an interesting user experience online, you select preferences, you get stuff sent to you, you keep what you need, send the rest back. Um, kind of is that bridge between physical and digital transactions that I, I think as, as a concept is maybe waning in, uh, in, at the moment, but I think it, it starts to create a, a new cycle of how people are used to 
or breaking the cycle of what people are, are used to buying mm-hmm. and, and how stuff is delivered to them and how it's not enough just to have you know a, a 24 hour same day delivery, mm-hmm. but that delivery has to have products and things that are meaningful to you. Exactly. Yeah, and for e-commerce, um, you know, going into into some of the projects I've worked on, um, I know for a fact that every time we worked on UX, it increased. Uh, um, it, it always increased the checkouts, mm-hmm. it increased the conversion rate. You know, uh, with the same amount of traffic. And I always tell people, uh, well, you should pay attention to your experience on your website because. With the same amount of traffic, you can double your sales, right? <laughs> so as long as you can double your conversion rate with the same amount of traffic that you've, you know, you're spending, you know, tirelessly, and and you're all these all this marketing is leading up to, uh, you know, all this traffic coming into your website. If you just double your conversion rate, you double your sales, you know, with the same mm-hmm. amount of traffic. When once you start telling people how it's actually going to. Um, to affect them or affect their pocketbooks, make them more money. That's when people are very, very interested mm-hmm. in the uh, in the user experience. You know, absolutely. You know, th- there's a field of marketing called shopper marketing, and it really looks at how does a physical layout of a store impact um, the volume of sales. Oh yeah. Unfortunately, I think there's been a little bit of a lag in, in that in the digital space and understanding how to optimize it to be able to get you know the sale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that may have been in you know some legacy terms of what success is. You know, what's the click rate? What's the bounce rate? Time mm-hmm. on site? I, I feel like uh, uh, those early metrics kind of impeded our ability to look at um, optimization of an overall flow of, of an experience, like you would in a physical location, to the digital space. And I think it's only come to time now where brands and uh, uh, store and company owners are beginning to look at that in greater detail because they can see the cause effect of that. Exactly to your point, if you show them a better experience is gonna yield more sales, they're then willing to invest the time to think about or pay someone to think about for them. And what is that, um, that path to purchase to be able to bring someone through the funnel? Yeah, yeah. So um, speaking of, you know, obviously this taking it a bit further. So what are your, some of your principles that you, um, you know, that you think um, are probably the best when designing a, an experience? Like what are some principles that you advise other people to look at? Yeah. You know, so there's some that I believe, and I know if you go online, you'll, you'll see different permutations of these and, and, you know, depending on what your, your background is, you're going to gravitate closer to some of these than others. But you know, for me, it, it all stems to the user, right? You know, what are, how are we defining and focusing on that user? And is there one type of user? Is there prospects and, you know, and return customers and, and how are they different? You know, what's the, their needs and expectations in a site? If it's a repeat customer and repeat purchase, you just want them there renewing as quickly and as easily as possible. You know, and obviously you could create ways to have uh, you know, repeat shopping carts so on a monthly basis stuff is sent out to them. If mm-hmm. it's you know, someone who's a prospect, there's more education that needs to be done up front. You, know, you have to look at the brand awareness. You know, how much do they know about a brand? Um, what education do you need to give to them in order for them to see that these products are relevant and meaningful? And then how do you actually move them through to be able to transact? So for me, it, it all comes down to starting with the user, defining who they are, what are their needs, what are their pain points, and creating some sets of different personas and other uh, ways of building their identity out, right? And mapping their paths forward to be able to take them through that sequence. So for me, again, as a marketer, as an anthropologist, it starts with that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's about being able to look at predictive analytics and behaviors. So it's kind of an extension of the first, but it's about really being able to say, okay, if I do this, what is the next most logical step and action that somebody's going to take? Mm-hmm. And is it the one that I want them to? Or have I designed the experience suboptimally and I need to change that flow to naturally fit with that user behavior? Mm-hmm. Because once you can identify that behavior and predict for it, you're going to then make it so much easier for people to engage with your site and be able to walk you through it. Exactly. So, so obviously, you know, that they kind of work together, but... Um, you know, we call that often anticipatory thinking about being able to look at those behaviors and map them out with each step. What's the cause and effect that happens? Mm-hmm. 
uh, we kind of alluded to this before, but the third one for me is that really reducing cognitive load. And these are the friction points. You know, where is there a point in the in the UX experience that is someone that someone's going to stop and be like, this doesn't make sense to me. This copy isn't right. I don't have the right uh, image to support this. It takes me down too many options to click, and therefore I'm not going to click any. I'm going to leave. Right, so cognitive load is just simply put as the user has to think too much about the action that they're going to be doing. So if you eliminate those friction points to make it as simple as possible, you're obviously gonna be able to guide them through that experience a lot easier and faster, taking them to the stuff that's actually more important to them. Right. Yeah, um, I, I know I would say that you know, a couple others you know, would be about oversimplifying the situation and particularly looking at functionality. Uh, you know, there was a time when having these multi built out navigation bars was the way to go. Mm -hmm. I think that that has definitely simplified with single page scrolling, where you would have, you know, max four, five, maybe six things on the top, and they kind of just correlate as you scroll down the page. By oversimplifying that functionality, it just makes it again so much simpler for someone to go through. Mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of goes to the next one about consistency. Consistency mm -hmm. counts, it matters. Some people may not be able to articulate a design is not right for them, but their actions will definitely tell. So if some part of a site experience is inconsistent, you're again, you're going to create roadblocks for someone who really just like, you know what, I, I, I don't want to go any further. Uh, it's uncomfortable for me. I don't want to do it. Exactly. Which, which kind of, I think it would go to a next one about, you know, building a road to go back, you know, building the, building the path home, you know, how are you helping that user to be able to hit that, that logo button or a back to be able to take them to something that is, again, a little bit easier, a little bit more comfortable for them so they can start that path again? I think far too often we create experiences that are just driving towards a sale and there's nothing wrong with that, but also bearing in mind that sometimes we have to allow the user to go backwards in order to go forwards again. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that ultimately comes down with just clarifying the call to action. Like, what do you want someone to do? Do you want them to learn more? buy now, you know, sign up for something. So having that clear CTA uh, will make all the difference in the world to be able to then increase the, uh, the, the time on site and the basket size there. Mm -hmm. It kind of goes without saying, but reducing errors, you know, these are some of the things, the 404s that, you know, drive me and other people nuts, you know, so if you have building out your site, check every link, make sure everything takes to the right page, uh, and manage those errors effectively. If you've got them, people are going to find them and they're going to, it's going to annoy the heck out of them. So the more you do that, the more value that you're creating and the more that their time, which is precious, is going to be seen as something that is worth, you know, investing in to be able to look at, okay, this, this site, this brand is something I want to come back to. Oh yeah. Have you, um, have you ever heard of, uh, Russell Brunson? Um, uh, he's the creator of click funnels. Mm -mm. Um, yeah, he has, um, he has a book. Uh, he, he has a few books. Uh, one of them is called Expert Secrets and another one's .com Secrets. I only read .com Secrets. And he talks about simplifying. He, he, you know, he obviously uh, goes a little bit deeper and, you know, we, we're, we're uh, you know, we don't have all the time in the world, but he goes a little bit deeper into what you talked about as well. And mm -hmm. um, he's talking about pretty much the whole book really just talks about simplifying the whole process, like just keep it simple, stupid, you know? Um, yeah. And, and, um, and yeah, he, he, um, he, so um, I don't know if you're familiar a little, uh, if you're familiar with ClickFunnels, but ClickFunnels is a company that um, allows you to create uh, landing pages, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're all about creating landing pages. And um, a lot of these, you know, quote unquote gurus uh, online use it, like the ones that are obviously uh, getting traffic from social media, like the Ty Lopez's and the, um, and um, who's the other guy, uh, super famous guy that, uh, that has people walking through fire. <laughs> who is this? Uh, uh, I don't know. Which uh, the guy's name, he's super, super big. Uh, Tony Robbins, Tony Robbins. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Tony Robbins, yeah. To, uh, Tony Robbins worked with uh, Russell Brunson. Okay. And um, in the book, he talked about, uh, um, so they, they, they met at a, at a Tony Robbins, um, first time they met was at a Tony Robbins event. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Russell Brunson told them, Hey, um, you know, like with the traffic that we have here at the event, I bet you I can triple your sales. 
and I can do it this weekend if you want. Yeah. And, I'll, and what I'll do is I'll show you how. So he built a landing page for, uh, um, they created something, you know, out of, out of the blue within one day, he created a landing page and uh, the landing page, I think was nothing but a video and a button to buy. <laughs> That's it. You know, it was that simple. And, and he talked about, uh, how, um, how Tony Robbins was incredibly impressed even though it's extremely simple, you know, he was incredibly impressed. And so he, I guess he hired, uh, uh, Russell Brunson to, to manage his, uh, his online experiences, you know, and then, yeah, and, it, uh, it, it, it's a great story of just being able to take something that would be nice to do and actually doing it. And yeah, you know, an old boss of mine uh, was looking at one of the things I had written at the time. And, you know, they, they said that it was so complicated, you know, mm -hmm. that it's like stereo instructions that, mm -hmm. you know, write, write this as if it was for your, your grandmother or your, your parents to understand. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I say that now, and it's something that I, I, I tell a lot of folks, and it's like, if you, if you use simple, clear language on that, people are going to get it and it's going to be more meaningful to them. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's a great ex example of just creating a simple look page a video and one button to, to have that action to move forward and people will do it because it, there's, there's, you've removed all those frictions. Exactly. Yeah. And that, you know, as I, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously in the, in the online marketing scene as well. And um, from what I've seen, a lot of these landing pages are starting to get simplified. Um, even successful e-commerce stores, um, you know, I, I go on Flippa. I've I've mm -hmm. I've bought and sold uh, websites on Flippa as well. Um, that's something that I obviously do on the side as well. Um, and um, some of the most successful e-commerce stores, even on Shopify, are extremely simple. You go to the homepage. And, um, and you can buy right away. <laughs> Those are usually the most successful. And, um, and they always, uh, there was some, I remember there was some guy that was selling uh, mugs and he had uh, Donald Trump uh, tweets on the mugs. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he was selling like the, the, you know, top tweets that were straight on the website. Like he didn't even yeah. have a he didn't even have a, a, an actual hero banner. He just literally had the products there uh, ready for you to buy. <laughs> it's just funny. And he was selling, uh, he was, you know, he was, selling. I think the, the, I think the website was in the, in the hundreds of thousands that he was selling per month. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, stuff that I've seen really, uh, really surprises me <laughs> so, and, and, and I've I, seen out there. I think that just goes back to anyone who's looking to create a website. Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a daunting task. You know, it's not something that takes, you know, weeks and months and years to be able to come up. It's something that is an iterative process. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. That if you've got an idea and you can spend a little bit of time just, you know, back at the napkin, it, mm -hmm. you know, you can go, you know, to, to folks like Louie and begin to get it made. Right? And just that simple little bit of clarity uh, that you have, will be able to, to get it to him to take it further to the next stage and be able to bring it to life to create those frames and, and then go back and forth on it. So I think that a lot of folks get hung up on that. It has to be perfect right off the bat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've seen that working with clients all the time. It's like, it doesn't have to be, you can just get something back of the napkin and then iterate, iterate, iterate. Exactly. That's really where the success comes from. Not it being the, the best thing right off the bat. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have a client who I'm not going to mention, you know, but um, we've tried to launch their website so many times, but they're trying to get the perfect website. And, um, and I told them, well, why don't we launch and you guys can collect feedback from the people mm -hmm. that are that you guys are trying to, to create the solution for, you know, so um, and they finally, uh, the, the, the CEO's wife finally just had enough. And she's like, we, we just got to launch it. Like at this point, you know, we've been trying to launch since probably for about six months now, yeah. you know, so it's, it's, uh, so it's, uh, they're, they're trying to launch with the perfect iteration of the website. And I told them guys like this doesn't happen. Even if you look back at the first version of Airbnb, you know, like mm -hmm. how rudimentary it was even Uber. I mean, a lot of these websites out there, the first version they launched is looks nothing like how it is now. You know, they've just by the process of collecting feedback, collecting data, they finally got it to the to the point that we're, we are at today. 
Yeah, and, and I think that's a great point, uh, you know, just reinforcing the iterative process that, that organizations take because you only see the current state. Mm -hmm. right? It's so difficult to look back at the different iterations mm -hmm. uh, of a website. And as a society, we're so not only risk adverse, but we're failure adverse as well. So mm -hmm. uh, if, if something is perceived to be not perfect or not right off the bat, there's a, a natural reluctancy not to publish it because of, oh, it's not the way that yeah, I need it to be at this point. Versus, you know, being able to take a much more progressive iterative approach and say, let's, let's launch it. Yeah, let's see how it does. It's a prototype and continuously moving it from there. Um, companies that do that, teams that, that scrum and do that type of stuff are able to accelerate stuff much faster and taking those learnings and insights. And over time, you'll see that that site will far outperform a company that works to do perfect off the bat. Mm -hmm. Right off the bat, they, they may outperform, but the, the long tail of that is the, the, the companies that iterate constantly to make it better are the ones that are going to ultimately succeed. Yep, and that is uh, that is one hundred percent correct. What are what are some um, obviously uh, you as an as an expert use a lot of different tools. Um, what are some tools that you suggest, or um, a few tools that maybe you use uh, to to kind of drill down that that user experience? Yeah, and, and we. we we, we've kind of highlighted a few of those through the conversation the, uh, thus far. You know, the first one for me, again, going back to the user at the core is creating the different personas. Like who are they? Put a picture to them, put their demographics, their technographics, their sociographics, their shopping habits, behaviors, any data that you can scrape and collect and find to create these composites for them is going to go a long way because when you and your team start to say, okay, we want to be able to create a, a, a product for, You've got a name for whom, right? Mm -hmm. What are their barriers? What are their pain points? What are frustrations that they have? And how is that particular solve going to be able to ameliorate that? Well, if you don't have a, a persona, you won't know, right? So, so being able to create and name these personas allow you to go back and forth and to be able to say, okay, we're going to create this uh, persona of Joe. Joe represents these things, these attributes. Here's how we need to be able to resolve and rectify it for them to create a, a positive experience. Mm -hmm. So for me, that, that's a no brainer when it comes to creating a, a powerful and meaningful user experience. The, the next on that, and we've, we've kind of talked about is the different user flows and wireframes. So how is someone in the most ideal state going to interact with your website, interact with your app, interact with your brand? Which kind of also then goes, you know, what what type of experience you want them to come away with having, you know, and and what is it that uh, is the current Excite experience? So uh, it, it's always fun if you have something to be able to do that now, like evaluate, you know, what is your wireframe? Evaluate what are your user flows? How is someone going to navigate? Where are the hiccups? And then to be able to take those learnings to say, okay, how can I make it better for them so that these problematic areas or these 404s or these roadblocks these friction points are gone. And then by doing so, you're able to create new wireframes and new user flows that are ultimately going to be a little bit more consistent on that. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the other tools that I like to use is prototyping. And it often gets a, a bad rap as being expensive and time consuming. And sometimes it is, but more often than not, you could do rapid prototyping, mm -hmm. uh, low fidelity stuff, and just knock stuff out of the park. You don't even have to publish it. Uh, you can just create it, review it, learn from it, and just continuously do the next and that really does help to, uh, to speed up the process as well. So uh, again, going back, often we're visual learners, things are impregnated into our mind visually. So when we, when we see it and we create these prototypes, uh, it's, it either makes sense or it doesn't make sense and we've got to go back to it. The next uh, I like to use is looking at that path to purchase and being able to map out the different ways that we're either going to drive to an action or drive to a sale. Mm -hmm. And so by mapping that out, again, it's kind of a, a, a dovetail of some of the earlier points, but it allows you to be able to see, um, are there things that I can do to simplify that path to purchase to either increase basket side, increase sales? If someone is on this, the, the card page, is there things that are co too complex on that, such as setting up delivery times, tracking info, uh, different transaction types, um, you know, using different cards and different apps, or is it, is it important to you just to have one of those things and just keep it simple? Right. And so being able to, to map that out really just goes a long way. 
Uh, and again, what's important is once that's created, it, to your earlier point, is getting that user feedback. Go back and do those interviews. Have site surveys up there. Get people who are you know repeat uh, purchasers and be able to have them look at some heat map and tracking uh, of your site. And you know there's there's tools that exist to do that for you and to really utilize those things to see. Okay, you know in my mind this made a lot of sense, but you know what, my my ideal customer is not seeing it the way that I did. Here's the data to prove that. Let's go back and let's make some changes here. So you know, these are a few of the tools that I like to use. And again, I see them as iterative to be able to grow and create a, a meaningful user experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and um, you know, one, one specific industry that needs a lot of this is I think uh, crypto <laughs> because um, there's, a, there's an altcoin that I, follow and they um uh the name is uh saitama so mm -hmm. that's the, that's the altcoin they're one of the new coins you know they they've been trying to launch this web uh, this app this exchange for uh for a long time and um and they kind of botched the whole launch <laughs> so mm -hmm. what happened was it done it, it uh that affected the coin price heavily um so um you know and what's 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 interesting is that at that level of the game, when you're risking so much, so much uh, investors, uh, 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 you know, it, well, all their investments, pretty much all their money, uh, when you're risking that much, um, I don't think you should definitely gamble. <clears throat> you should gamble with, uh, you know, just launching something without actually mapping it out, prototyping it. Um, you know, their first launch, they they had a lot of, um, um, you know. A lot of these UX errors that we spoke about, um, and they they um, they broke a lot of these uh, a lot of these rules, you know. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, and what I feel is that they um, they kind of bypassed this whole prototyping stage, you know. Yeah. I think they kind of cut a big corner, and they didn't uh, focus on their user experience, and this affected their launch heavily, you know. So this mm -hmm. hit their bottom line. Um, and that is, uh, that is just one instance that I can tell you where, uh, where someone should have used some of these tools that you mentioned, um, especially this uh, rapid prototyping, even, even to you know, just prototype it and map out how the user is going to go about their purchase or mm -hmm. to get to the goal. Um, but, um, but yeah, a lot of these apps that I've seen also are, are um, they probably, they, you know, mm -hmm. they've they've launched without actually just putting some sort of uh, thought into their user. You know, I, I, I noticed, you know, now that these tools that are coming out, you know, that allow, um, you know, users to build different things. Um, as I see more of that coming out, I do see a lot of these UX rules being broken. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I see a lot of failures because they're not using, um, you know, they're not thinking about the, the customer, the, the end user. Uh, from the beginning, you know, so um, that's just one thing that I wanted to share. But um, I know that uh, you, um, so do, do you recommend any, you know, literature or anything um, that can help you get better at UX or that can maybe if anyone is interested in, in learning more about UX can, can, go, uh, can go find a little bit more information? Yeah, you, you know, this may put me as old school, but there's some, a couple of found, foundational books, <laughs> yes, <laughs> books, <laughs> that, that, that I think would go a long way. And so I'll start with the books and then we can talk about some of the online stuff. So uh, The Design of Everyday Things, which I mentioned earlier, is a fantastic book. Uh, the Laws of UX is, is one of those seminal books for anyone looking into get uh, into the field of UX and CX. Elements of uh, user experience, again, an OG. Um, Don't Make Me Think is another great book. And Lean UX, uh, Designing Great Products, are probably some, some of the foundational books. If, it's, if UX, CX is something that you're interested in, you should be aware of and have read these books uh, and help to build the vernacular of you know, what, what UX is. Uh, outside of physical books or eBooks, you know, there's a tremendous amount of websites that, that you can look at and folks they publish a lot of stuff for free out there online. Um, and, and I think joining some of these either Facebook groups or online groups, um, UX groups, and that will just help you to see what's coming down the pike and just understanding why some of the decisions are being made. You know, I, I'll tell you that 
uh, as a group of people, folks who are UX designers are generally very open and collaborative with their information. They're very willing to share stuff because it ultimately makes the field much, much better and brighter. Exactly. So, you know, it, it's one of these things, if you show the initiative and the effort and you've got a baseline of information, people are going to go the extra mile to help you understand it better. So um, start with some of the books as the basics, look, do some searching online, reading some of the different websites. It'll really help you to just get your foot in the door and, and then play around, right? You know, actually create some stuff yourself and post it on some of these forums and get, get the feedback from people who are on there and mm -hmm. use that constructive feedback and criticism as a way just to make your style and your designs better. Yeah. What are some new things that you're um, seeing in the space as far as like user <clears throat> user experience, customer experience, um, some maybe, um, you know, um, just new trends that you see uh, that maybe some some someone that's listening to this podcast might want to take into account on their website? Yeah, I, I think the first thing is that the whole notion of uh, customer experience and user experience is now part of business vernacular. And, and I would say that 10 years ago, it, it wasn't. It was something that only progressive organizations knew about and teams were like contemplating. And those who did it well, won a bunch of awards for you know, best websites. I think what you're seeing now is that there's become a democratization of UX where almost everybody knows it, hears it. All, you know, students at university are taking classes in it uh, knowingly or unknowingly, some of these things. So I, I think that the trend has been is just to disseminate uh, what UX and CX is as, as a way for people just to overall understand it. And you see that in some of the new websites that are being designed and tools that exist today uh, that are making it that much easier. So, you know, in terms of some of the tools and some are free, some you've got to pay for, but, you know, Adobe XD is a great tool, you know, to look at prototyping and overall um, um, micro integrations uh, of how different pieces of information are working together. Um, Illustrator, and, and again, you know, you don't just need to be a graphic designer to do that, but, you know, it has great graphic design, web design, and wire framing capabilities yeah. to be able to do um, Photoshop again, you know, in the Adobe suite is something that will help to do some of these in the editing, uh, mm -hmm. because unfortunately, pictures matter, right? And, and that that comes down to such an important part of UX is do you have the right image at the right resolution, mm -hmm. that's going to be able to convey because if you create the most beautiful site experience, and you've got high pixelated low fidelity images, <laughs> it's going to be crap. Right. Yeah. So, so if, if you have or can take in raw and know how to manipulate those photos, mm -hmm. the better off you're going to be, oh, or, yeah. you know, hiring someone who can do that for you, mm -hmm. but uh, definitely the, the more you can do that, the better off uh, you're going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I always tell, you know, my students and teams, like download and play with sketch. It's, there's a free version. There's a paid version play around with it. There's so much that you could do, you know, outside of the, the Adobe world. Uh, that's a little bit cheaper to do um, and, and it'll help you to master some of these skills and build up the uh, the dexterity of creating stuff um, you know pretty quickly and easily mm -hmm. and um yeah i mean i i know adobe is is um is rapidly expanding their suite of tools um i know they um, I forget what what it's called but they did launch a mobile um i think a mobile is it is it like a mobile web design app too? Yeah, um, I can't. I can't recall what it's called, but um, but anyways, I know they're expanding um heavily, and I think they just purchased uh, Magento as well, which mm -hmm. is uh, which is used to be an open source. Um, or I I don't know if it was completely open source, but uh, it, it was uh, mainly a, a e commerce solution. So they're they're rapidly expanding their their whole um their whole universe of of these tools, not just the design tools, but also to design, uh, exp you know, user experiences to design websites. Um, so, um, yeah. And, and, you know, the Magento is an interesting one because it, it's kind of gone head to head with the Wix and the Shopify's and, and the WooCommerce, mm -hmm. you know, and each one of those have their different strengths on it. And mm -hmm. one of the Magento strengths is the, the visualization they put in there and they, they really tried just to, to simplify a few things. Um, you know, and, but I would say that, if you compare that in a Shopify, Shopify yeah. has more tools in it that you can utilize and building out 
templates mm -hmm. that are much more accessible, whereas Magenta, you've kind of defined that yourself. So, you know, de depending on if, if, again, if cost is no option, being mm -hmm. able to look at um, which one of those paths better suit your style. If you want stuff that's completely custom, the Magenta may be a better way to go. If you want to follow a template to get your teeth wet uh, mm -hmm. sink your, and sink your teeth into, then a Shopify, WooCommerce, Wix is, is, a, is a better path for you to start. Yeah, so. Exactly. Yeah, every time, we, um, every time we get a new client that's interested in e-commerce, there's a few questions that I always ask them. But one of them is, um, what is your experience with, with uh, e-commerce? You know, mm -hmm. are you, have you already had experience managing an e-commerce store? If it's your first time, um, Shopify obviously got it right. You know, that's the reason why they're the biggest e-commerce platform, I think now. Mm -hmm. And I tell, uh, I tell, um, you know, these prospects, I tell them, uh, well, you know, obviously if you're looking for something extremely simple, you know, extremely user-friendly, then Shopify is going to be your best bet. And I think, yep. I think that's one thing they capitalized on. I think that's the reason why Shopify is actually very successful. Um, if you take a look at Wix or um, Squarespace, for example, they mm -hmm. also, you know, GoDaddy website builder, they all have e-commerce uh, solutions baked into them as well. But um, Shopify from the get-go has been uh, e-commerce website platform only, you know, yes. so they've, they've managed to perfect their, their whole, and, you know, even Shopify, they keep changing their whole, you know, they, they even change, like, I think it's, it's been a few months, but they recently changed the, the way the, um, the way the experience is for the, for the managing users to, mm -hmm. to, ma mm -hmm. to manage the back end they they they're still changing you know they're still they're still evolving their whole platform but i think um as far as shopify they definitely got the um the the user the the management side of it they got it right you know because it's just very very simple if you log into like woocommerce or magento for example like i, I have experienced magento um magento for example um you know it used to confuse uh, it used to confuse people, <laughs> you know, it used to confuse the, the admins, like, yeah. like, where do I find this? How do I get this? It was very, um, it wasn't user friendly. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't user friendly. And it didn't think about like, um, you know, is, is the user, uh, is the user, is it their first time managing an e-commerce store? Um, so these are things that obviously I asked ask about, you know, uh, in the beginning, um, in my questionnaire when starting with a new client. Um, but you know, Shopify definitely has it right. WooCommerce as well allows more customization, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's also not that user-friendly. And of course you have to keep updating it because it's, it's, uh, it's off of the, the WordPress engine. Right. So, um, so yeah, but, um, speaking about other tools, like what do you, what else do you recommend? Um, I know uh, Balsamic uh, or Balsamic, how do you, how do you say it? <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but we'll, we'll call it like the vinegar, Balsamic. <laughs> so I know Balsamic, I, I've used it quite a bit. It's so simple and it's, mm -hmm. it's great to use. Um, I've also used uh, Marvel as well. Um, yeah, Envision Studio is, is another good one um to, you know for people to start to play around with and, and and i'm sure that there are so many other tools that are out there um look around and and find it you know yeah. it, it, there's no shortage of tools uh, it's just coming coming down to engaging with them and you know setting your your intentions right off the bat of what do you yeah. want to do with that tool mm -hmm. exactly and um i know how are you with time by the way are you are you still good with time or yeah I, i've got about 15 more minutes here uh, we can we can uh, we can go through yeah, no yeah. problem i wanted it i wanted to see if you wanted to break down a, a website you know and just kind of go through the whole methodology of it um, yeah the, 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 there's a couple of websites that that i think have done a really good job um for different ways so uh, i'll share your do you want to share your screen and maybe pull it up um I'm going to talk through it if, okay. uh, because I, I want people to first understand and then we can pull it up. So uh, um, a lot of people will know NPR as for its, its you know, radio and auditory messaging. Mm -hmm. 
it also has a very robust website that allows for a, a lot of rapid discovery of content. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't naturally think of it as, as a content engine, uh, like a newscast station. However, they have created a fantastic uh, experience that I think for many users would really surprise and delight them that you can discover content that they won't necessarily talk about on air in your location, but they brought to life in ways that they've made it very digestible with really clear headlines mm -hmm. um, and, and copy that's really snackable underneath until you click on it and you could either read more or click the video. And they've also created a good balance of near ground and foreground. So you know, mm -hmm. they have you know, a white copy field with a gray background. So that really sets the focus to your eye to be able to see exactly what you're looking at. And, and where, why I think that's important is because again, being, being a lot of visual learners on, on things, when we see stuff, we have to know, tell our eyes where to go and look at it. So I, I think that as an organization, they've done a fantastic job being able to build out a site that in many ways surprises and delights people when they first go, but also can be highly modular and adjusted based on your interests and your preferences to be able to give you stuff in, in a quick bit mm -hmm. at the headlines, or if you've got the time to really click on it and go check it out. So I think that they've done a, a really good job at that. But this earlier, which is Air, Airbnb. So their first version was definitely not what it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see that they become not only solution oriented with a really strong call to action right off the bat of just getting people to go in and to make a booking, right? It's, it's become as simple as that. They know why you're there. You know why you're there, right? And it's like, it, look at a page. So you know you're going to go somewhere. You know when. Mm -hmm. What's going to help drive that decision? They know that social proof via reviews are going to be the top thing that you're going to be looking at. So they put that right off the bat. Right. And then they have the information in there about, you know, featured places and then discovering new places. And they've really made it easy for you just to go in and find a place that suits your needs and your habits. And if you have an account with them, you can go into your preferences and you can make changes so that it will auto feed to you stuff that aligns based on the things that you're looking for. So they've taken, again, data utilization for your preferences and showing you stuff that's been tagged in the back end that's gonna be relevant to you. While at the same time, it's hugely personal, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't feel like it's a, a commerce site, you know, a, a property commerce site. Mm -hmm. they've, they've been able to use really beautiful photos. And I don't know if they still do, but you know, they used to be able to send a photographer out to your property and they would photograph it for you. And that was a way that they ensured consistency, right? And an ideal brand experience by photographing in a similar style, in a similar way that every time you would go and you would see their photos, you would know that it's an Airbnb quality photo uh, and place that you could go to. Again, I don't know if they still do that, but that was one of their things that they did you know, early on. Uh, and I think it paid off for them to be able to get really high quality pictures of the, of the homes. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the last one in a different category is the Khan Academy. Right, so as an education provider, education can often be really dry and how you really would engage with that site, but they did a really good job addressing very specific audiences and the type of information that you need to know. Are you a student? Are you a parent? Are you a, a teacher or facilitator needing to get information out there? And so they've grouped it in a way and through the use of color and imagery to be able to guide someone through the, you know, the scroll to be able to say, ah, this is meaningful for me. I, I'm over here, this is meaningful for me. And so they've done a decent job being able to build it out in a way that helps the user to actually get to what they need because they know that not every user has the same goals. Mm -hmm. And so by, by building that out that way, you know, I think they've been able to just, I'm assuming, maximize the amount of transactions that they've been able to get in, in their students to an enrollment because they've been able to identify and isolate the types of information needed at each one of those phases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I know we're a little short on time, so what I'll do is I'll just uh, when we're editing, we'll pull up the we'll pull up the website so other users can can see it side by side. <laughs> yeah, perfect, perfect. I think that's a lot better. Yeah, and uh, I know we're a little short on time, so what I'll do is I'll just uh, when we're editing, we'll pull up the we'll pull up the website so other users can can see it side by side. <laughs> yeah, perfect, perfect. I think that's a lot better. Um, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about. Um, you know, as closing statements, um, 
I know that um, there's some e-commerce, we kind of already dove a little bit into the e-commerce uh, platforms, you know, such as Shopify, Wix, yeah. uh, Commerce, uh, Magento and all that. Um, so what, what do you, um, do you have any thoughts on this, like these uh, future technologies or how, you know, UX might be evolving uh, as far as like e-commerce? Yeah, and just you know, one step out of e-commerce, but I think that the pandemic has created a new environment of working remotely and the normalization of that. And so I think that you know, there's obviously you know the Zooms and the different video chat platforms and Teams has theirs, uh, but you you're now starting to see new um, organizations come up with new collaboration tools. So Active Collab and Mural are, are two that I think are just like the bee's knees and being able to help people to have information there that allows them to collaborate in a way that is very fluid, very dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can insert pictures and copy and video. Um, and, you know, and, and I guess I would put Slack in there as well, who's a little bit older um, oh, yeah. com compared to, to Mural and Active Collab, but are doing a fantastic job to accommodate people who are working more remote in, in more creative free spaces. And you know, while I think that the Teams um, by Microsoft has its value, it unfortunately is not the best user experience. So um, for me, when I would compare the two from a UX perspective, Active Collab and Mural have a much more intuitive user experience to it than you know, being able to look at, at a Microsoft uh, Teams, for example. So it's like night and day in the styles of collaboration and what the ethos is for those three organizations. Yeah. But, but I think, you know, again, that starts to set some of the foundation uh, in, in terms of what we're doing, which goes back to, I think, to some of the traps that we talked about. So, you know, how much are we valuing the, um, the balance of value and benefits? Right? Is it valuable for the organization mm -hmm. and the user or the user, right? So being able to look at that. Now, it's important in the trap of like not defining who your audience is and their needs right off the bat. Mm -hmm. If you're not looking at that and not clearing those attentions, your site experience is gonna suffer at that because it, you're creating something that is very ambiguous as opposed to rooted uh, in exactly who you're, you're creating the experience for. And then ultimately not acknowledging the design is subjective, right? And, and I think that that is a trap that we all fall into. Everyone has an opinion on it. So when you create your, your wireframes and your user experiences, um, put, the, put some of your assumptions in there, put some of your preferences and share those when you present stuff off the bat to your clients uh, or as you're building your own knowledge base because that will help to set a playing field for them to know why you came up with some of those decisions and recommendations. And the person you're presenting and sharing to may have different ones. And that's great because that's where the conversation will come up with and being able to say, okay, these are your assumptions. These are your needs. This is how I created this. Now, how do we marry them together? And I'd say last on that is, is not considering some of the other uh, axial pieces of, of UX design, which is looking at color theory. So how does color influence uh, what we're doing? You can go and Google color theory and you'll see that the use of red on a website is, mm -hmm. is an angry color and that generally is avoided because it elicits you know, an urgency to leave versus exactly. blues and greens are you know, getting people to stay and be more calm on that. And you know, different uses of yellows and orange to be uplifting and effervescent. So color plays a huge thing in your site experience. So take the time to look at that. Mm -hmm. Typography and casing is another one of these things. I, I, I love typography, uh, but I think it, you have to walk the fine line. How easy is it uh, to be viewed? And, and I always tell people, do the squint test. So if you squint, can you still read it? You know, um, is it a font that easily translates on a mobile phone, on a tablet, on a computer, and is a universal font? Yeah. right? That if you don't have that font in your library, that's still going to show up and still going to look good. So those are things just to be aware of. And then creating a clear tone of voice. Often, that, you know, when you're creating websites, there's different authors that are going to be creating different pieces and content. Mm -hmm. Take the time to be able to set up some guidelines in advance that goes through, you know, again, who you're designing for, what are the needs, what's the tone of voice of that document, so that when you go and you go to publish it, that all of that stuff has a very uh, common flow or at least one editor to look at um, so that when the, the, the viewer is, using, is looking at it, it seems as if it's natural from one person as opposed to all over the field. Because again, these are some things that as an author, you may not notice it, but the reader will definitely pick up on it. So 
Um, again, I guess in, in closing, those would be some of the, the traps to be mindful of. Um, and just don't, uh, don't hold what you're doing as the site experience as the final right off the bat. Mm -hmm. embrace, embrace that the imperfection in it, iterate it, get it better, share it with people, and you'll ultimately create a much better user experience. That's, uh, that's fantastic knowledge that you shared <laughs> with anyone that's, that's, you know, thinking about launching a website, start with these, uh, you know, make sure you're not falling into these website traps, yeah. especially it's going to, it's all this is going to definitely affect your uh, bottom line. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, any other, um, you know, as we're nearing uh, the end of the podcast, um, anything else that you might want to share? Um, I know that uh, you mentioned Mural. Um, I thought you said Miro uh, because there is also a great tool called Miro. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, right. uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I used it constantly. It's fantastic. Um, I think it's, I think it doesn't get enough attention, by the way. <laughs> it's a, but it's fantastic. It's sort of like an online collaboration whiteboard um, yep. where you can yep. see everyone. Um, you can see all the users that are in this whiteboard collaborating together. I just wanted to th throw that in there that it's it's also an amazing tool uh, for anyone that's wanting to collaborate. Um, but um, yeah, I, I guess I would just uh, close on there are a tremendous number of tools out there. Don't mm -hmm. become reliant on the tool really build your knowledge base and let let your knowledge base and understanding guide and influence which tools are best to use for certain things because right. uh, at, at the end of the day a client isn't going to care what tool that you use they, they're going to care about the output exactly. so um, it seems it's easy to find a tool to do it all for you but uh, the tool is only as smart as the user who is using it so take the time learn the foundation understand the basics of what you need to accomplish and then work backwards and forwards from that to be able to create you know, the best user experience you can. Fantastic, Aaron. Well, um, I think we've reached the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. And your knowledge. And uh, yeah, let's do it again. <laughs> Absolutely. We shall do it again, guys. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our third podcast. <laughs> Take care, Aaron. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Take care. Bye-bye. So...